Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Melissa Chu and I'm director of the Herschel Museum and Sculpture Garden and we're so excited this evening because this is our first ever Zoom public program. We have lots to get to talk about tonight and we're delighted and honored to welcome artist Kent Monkman in conversation with Stefana Kant. Many of you would have already tuned in to some of the efforts that we've made since our public closure at the Hirshhorn, including Maker's Mornings via Instagram, our artist diaries that we release each week uh, that I've uh, co-organized with the Astor Gates, which is intended as a, um, uh, the, the chance for us to see how artists are living with art in quarantine. For more, you can tune in to the hashtag Hirshhorn Inside Out. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing our wonderful artist tonight, Kent Monkman, because Stefan Kant, our chief curator, has worked with him, commissioned his work, and most of all, and best of all, um, we're very excited to be able to talk about the work that we currently have on display at the Hirshhorn. So we'll be able to get some insights from Stefan from a curatorial perspective and hear from Kent Monkman. So without further ado, I turn over to our chief curator, Stefan Ekan, to be in conversation with Kent Monkman. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Kent, waiting for Kent. There we go. Here you are. But your audio is, uh, I think you're on mute. I turned it off. There you go. There you go. Good to see you in your colonial setting. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is a first for all of us. It's a, it's a Zoom conversation. It's great to have you with us. Um, um, Kent, uh, as Melissa said, uh, yes, I've, I've had the, the pleasure to be working or to work with you for, for years in, uh, in, in, in various ways. And um, uh, I can't forget the first time I, I, I met you at your studio. I forget the street. It was that tiny studio where you were painting Trappers of Men, I think in 2006. Uh, absolutely glorious painting that um, that is now in the collection of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, but from the start, actually, and I think that's that's what um, explains that you now have these incredible paintings up uh, at the Met and um, and your work at the Hirshhorn is that uh, you defined your path in a very clear way through the guise of mischief eagle testicle. Um, wandering and rampaging um, through uh, Western art history and uh, redoing the script uh, that had cast uh, the indigenous people in certain positions uh, rather than others and basically flipping uh, our Western art history onto itself uh, through painting. You're known as a painter, but also gloriously beautiful drawings, videos, uh, installations, uh, um, breathtaking installations and uh, where there's both a, a mixture of, of great melancholy because the, uh, the, the topics that you address uh, bring, bring uh, you know, much sadness to, to minds and hearts, but also uh, a great humor, uh, that of a trickster. And aside from installations, uh, uh, videos and, and photography. So we're here to basically um, uh, uh, unwrap all this and uh, maybe we can uh, maybe you want to say a few words um, or we can start off with uh, with the work that's currently on in manifest go yeah, ahead sure. Ken. Sure with that i mean it's great it's great to be uh here with you all and thank you for inviting me i'm super excited that uh, uh, honor dance is uh, currently at the Hirshhorn, so that's uh, exciting. I think to see a painting that was inspired by something in the collection of the, the Smithsonian to sort of find a home in in DC uh, in the museum there, and um, you know it's always been really important for me to reach a wide audience because you know the audience the the museum going audience of North America has been. 
uh, has received a very lopsided, one-sided sort of European settler version of our history. And that's been my program over these years is to infiltrate that, that very subjective point of view and to redress uh, so much of the erasure, the um, dispossession of uh, Indigenous people, of my own people from our own land, and to bring um, to bring a perspective that really celebrates our resilience, to cel that celebrates our understanding of gender and sexuality that was, you know, pretty much uh, suppressed by the settlers who didn't understand it, and to really speak from uh, an empowered position of reclaiming, um, you know, uh, these narratives that have been uh, erased over, you know, the last uh, couple hundred years. Right, and so that painting that that's currently on display in, in manifesto is um, is uh, based on a painting by George Caitlin, which is basically sits across the mall. It's a Smithsonian American Art Museum, and it's that of the dance of the bird ash. Um, and yours is uh, your own take on the on the bird ash, a more celebratory and festive uh, vision of uh, of that tradition. Maybe we can see the images, and you can you can. Um, Explain. So now I, I just want to tell you again that since this painting has been on, of course, and currently galleries are closed, but we've only had like rave reviews and comments by everyone. The visitors' service attendants were thrilled. Visitors were thrilled. It's one of these things that just, you know, creates a, a thrill in, the, in everyone who sees it. But go ahead. So, um, when I first came across Catlin's version of this painting, um, you know, I was really digging deep into art history for uh, to see, you know, um, the kinds of images that artists like George Catlin were making about Indigenous people. And there were very few representations of the two-spirited person, the person who lived uh, between genders, the person who, uh, you know, male or female, who, who basically lived in the opposite gender their entire lives. and. I came across this painting, Dance to the Bear Dash by George Catlin. And what was remarkable about it was not, not just this, you know, kind of attempt at a faithful uh, portrayal of the scene, but it was also the contradiction of his, his writing. So in his own text, you know, he wrote about this, this, this custom, this honor dance in, in the Sac and Fox tribe as being one of the most disgusting things he'd ever seen. And, and how he wished that it would be extinguished before it could be more fully recorded. So here is a, a man who purported to be a sort of faithful documentarian of, it, of indigenous people. And yet when he came across something that, you know, he found to be disgusting or offensive, he kind of, you know, he painted it, but at the same time, he was hoping, sort of wishing for, for this, this custom to disappear. And, you know, this really became the crux of my work. And I, I took inspiration for this piece uh, and, and for, for a number of artworks, because it really points towards that um, that that different way of understanding not just gender and sexuality, but just understanding the world and and how different Indigenous people think about how we relate to each other, how we are in kinship with each other. Even if you know you have a, a different way of understanding gender or sexuality, there's a place for you in our communities. And that, that also speaks to, you know, how we also um, understand our relationship to the settlers and, and our relationship to nature, to animals. And, you know, here's this beautiful um, honor dance um, that Catlin painted, but it was really infused by his own bias, uh, which was, of course, uh, very common in that period of time. So that painting, you know, uh, you know, uh, Dance to the Bear Dash became a uh, five channel video installation, which you showed at the Montreal Museum, which I, is still one of my favorite pieces. And I, I, I don't get a chance to, to exhibit that piece often enough, but um, I was uh, able to bring that, that piece to life through video and, and music. No, it was a great, great, it's a great, great piece, Dance to the Bear Dash. Maybe you, now that you know, I'm looking at the screen and I see Honor Dance and I see you, uh, right there, uh, a little bit more. That's that's the original uh, dance to the bird ash uh, by um, by Kathleen. But your your piece. Uh, well, maybe you want to talk about honor dance. There you are, mischief eagle testicle. Can you tell us about that that um, that persona? So I created mischief because um, 
you know, I wanted to, well, first of all, I wanted to reverse the gaze. I wanted an artistic, as a, an artistic persona that could kind of look back at the settler uh, cultures, the, the people that were, you know, examining us and um, kind of reclaim that position of power and, and turn them into uh, my subject. Uh, but really, I wanted to create a, a persona that could really inhabit that position of empowered sexuality, of, of empowered understanding of gender. And uh, so that's where Miss Chief was born. And, and she, she really began uh, very simply in a very tiny little painting, which we can also show called Artist and Model. And that was very much about uh, reversing the gaze. Yeah, let's um, let's look at artists and models because it's a tiny painting. Well, so not so tiny, but it's just uh, it it says it all. Uh, there we go. So this was the first kind of incarnation of the character on canvas, and um, you can see that she really I stole her look from Cher. And uh, you know I was uh, I grew up in the '70s, and uh, you know I love Cher, and I was particularly. Uh, uh, impressed with uh, Cher's uh, half-breed costume, her Bob Mackie costume. And, you know, for me, that really, it spoke to, you know, um, cultural appropriation, but also gender bending. And, and so I thought, well, you know, I want to inject this um, element of uh, glamour and fun and sexiness into this character. And so that was where, that was the kind of the jumping off point for, for Mischief in that, in that very first painting. And you can see she's, you know, her, her, her subject is this, you know, cowboy, the Saint Sebastian, you know, has long been this uh, kind of homoerotic icon in Western uh, painting. And, um, you know, she's thrown her hatchet and taken out his camera. So this, this painting is also kind of a, a conversation about painting versus photography. And, um, you know, when I thought about painting and, and you know, the evolution of painting and, and, and painting through uh, modernity, painting, the, the, the importance of painting and the purpose of painting really kind of got usurped by photography. So, um, but I'm such a fan of great history paintings. And uh, so it was a way to begin also that conversation about painting versus photography and kind of really being a, uh, a true painter and just loving painting um, so much. And there's so much you can say with a painting that you can't say in a photograph. And uh, when you talk about, um, when you say you're such a fan of, of uh, history painting, um, I mentioned earlier Trappers of Men. I think it's one of these uh, extraordinary works. Um, maybe we can, we can uh, get to it. Um, it's not so much a history painting, it's a great landscape, but it was painted by Pierre So let's see the original painting that it's based on. Here's Trappers of Men. Um, and the original painting uh, also sits across the mall uh, at, at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It's called Among the Sierra Nevada. And uh, Bierstadt would paint these, these immense landscapes in, in the mid 60s, 1860s, when the railroad was, was making you know, the, um, the West. Uh, uh, Westway uh, movement uh, possible, uh, but as propaganda paintings. I mean, I think this painting circulated all throughout Europe in its original form, in its Bierstadt form. And they were propagandas to colonize the West. And uh, the original painting by Bierstadt has just deers and, and does. And, and, and there you have uh, a totally different scene. And maybe you can uh, explain it much more than I, much better than I could, uh, but Mischief Eagle Testicle, again, appearing in some sort of revelation to, um, to these people. Do you want to expand on this painting? For sure. So and I guess- by the way, Oh, sorry. For our, uh, the viewers who, uh, uh, who have not seen it, it is bigger than the original. It's 13 feet wide and it's got an immense golden gilded frame around it. So it's really a great, great history painting. So, you know, as I did my research, you know, cycling through the, the art history of this continent, like looking at what the settlers were painting, um, you know, one of, one of the genres were these fabulous, like, you know, monumental history, uh, landscape paintings, which uh, were um, really celebrating the, uh, the, the real estate that was available, um, which, which um, 
you know, reinforce this idea that North America was an empty continent. Well, it wasn't an empty continent at all. There were millions and millions of indigenous people living here. And so it was a lie. It was this way of, you know, um, selling the West as this sort of empty paradise. You can see the clouds have this kind of biblical quality to it. So that also kind of brought it back to um, exploring some of the themes of uh, the Christian ideologies that had such a profound impact on on how this continent was colonized and how indigenous people were colonized. Um, so I, I, I just saw these very theatrical looking um, settings as these amazing places to, to stage uh, these tableaus, uh, these narratives of indigenous people um, interacting with uh, the settlers. And of course, mischief started to take uh, uh, center stage and, and kind of her character also started to evolve and it really, uh, began, it was a, a journey to understand who, who the character was and uh, over the years I've developed the character more and more and, and created more uh, more of a backstory and just recently I've been uh, writing uh, Miss Chief's memoir which will be published hopefully uh, in the coming year uh, with my writing partner Giselle Gordon and in, in that project we've been able to really fill in some of these gaps in understanding who who this character is and Really, she's this legendary being that that kind of um, runs in this parallel universe with the other legendary beings in Cree cosmology. So our, uh, she's sort of in the parallel universe of our trickster characters and our other legendary beings. So she is this kind of timeless um, legendary being who kind of exists in all these different time periods. And uh, here uh, she's like a this apparition of beauty, like this Venus kind of rising from the water and she's interacting with these different trappers. And I think Catelyn is in this painting as well as uh, Pollock and Mondrian. So I was having some fun with thinking about, you know, again, that conversation about painting and how painting changed uh, in relationship to photography. There's Edward Curtis over there on the, the left and uh, how the, the whole point of painting sort of evolved, you know, through modernism into something very different than what it was in that period of time. Um, you mentioned uh, um, uh, mischief being being a, a sort of a legendary being. I'd like us to go to the um, um, uh, the emergence of a legend. Uh, that series of five. Um, Photographs. I forget the the um, the um, silver prints. The 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 word in English to describe that technique. Can well, you can you yeah, run us through these these uh, these incarnations of uh, of mischief? So the emergence of a legend was uh, a project I did in collaboration with a friend, Chris Chapman, and. What I wanted with these, uh, the more the more I got into the the, the histories, the art histories, it, it kind of, and you know, I created this character, and I was like, okay, now I'm actually, um, you know, intersecting with performance art culture. And the more I sort of researched about indigenous performance art art culture, it actually took me back to Europe. Um, you know, indigenous people were were performers. They were in performing the Wild West shows. They were performing in vaudeville. They were performing in Europe, and uh, there was a, a couple of troops of indigenous people that were actually um, taken to Europe and used by Catlin to promote his gallery, his North American oh. gallery in in London and Paris and so forth. So this was an this was a project to kind of um, flesh out this backstory of mischief where she's uh, interacting with Catlin himself. And so this first image is uh, was me kind of imagining this chief, you know, in, in a Wild West show as a sharpshooter character. And then if we could see the next image. And here she is as this kind of vaudeville character on stage. Next one, please. It's like a little bit of a Cindy Sherman, your own, your own take on Cindy Sherman. <laughs> And here I was kind of imagining, you know, then, you know, and then it was the beginning of the silent film era, right? And at, at around the same time, you know, 2004 was when I made my first sort of Super 8 film, Group of Seven Inches, where Mischief is like in this old tiny black and white uh, film. And so this was also exploring the, um, the problems of, uh, of representing Indigenous people in Hollywood cinema, you know, going back to the early silent films of the works of Edward Curtis. This was really, 
again, going back to the work of Edward Curtis. Um, so uh, can we see the next one, please? And then finally, you know, mischief kind of like taking control of the, uh, the storytelling uh, as the film director and getting behind the camera. And, and uh, one of my films, Shooting Geronimo, uh, really plays with mischief, really messing with the narrative of one of these old Westerns. So I think there's one more. I think there's one more. Yeah, and this is the Trapper's Bride. So this was really just uh, creating a character uh, where Mischief is actually, um, you know, one of her lovers is this trapper. And so she appears in, in a couple of different paintings as this Trapper's Bride. Yeah. Um, we've talked about Mischief and, and we'll get to those, those extraordinary paintings that are at the Met. Um, maybe at the end, but um, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to uh, maybe to bring you to uh, subjects or topics that are not, you know, uh, all about entertainment. Well, not that that is, but um, uh, the current pandemics, we had a little chat, you know, right after the, the outbreak uh, saying, hey, it doesn't bring to mind, you know, the epidemics that, uh, that uh, ravaged the, um, the indigenous populations from the very start, from the very first contact, it's a, the virgin soil effect where these bacteria would come and, you know, we know of, of all the, the terrible uh, uh, havoc that smallpox, for instance, did. Even the common cold was brought to the continent by European settlers and so many um, other uh, forms of uh, diseases. So, um, and, and you had something, you said, yeah, it certainly does, you know, uh, bring that to mind. So that's, that's one topic that's not been, um, you know, uh, uh, discussed uh, that much. And also, all, I'd like to hear you talk about all the work that you did in the wake of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Report that's, um, um, I don't know what instance uh, in Canada came up with, but five years ago, and it really founded the, the current policy on um, uh, the relation with the indigenous people all throughout Canada, and it was a, an assessment of of, um, of the great great harm that had been done in the residential school systems. And I know that the uh, your Cree, your swampy Cree from Manitoba, Manitoba was really hard hit uh, by the residential school system. All the provinces were, but Manitoba very hardly um, or very uh, harshly. Um, can you tell us about these these projects that you've done? Sure. Well, why don't we start with the body bag, uh, just going back to the pandemic, you know, uh, there were millions and millions of, of indigenous people here. Can we see the uh, body bag image? Um, you know, the, when the Europeans arrived here, there were millions and millions of indigenous people, of course, who were um, decimated with smallpox. Actually, smallpox was kind of, can we just stay on that first image? Uh, yeah, that one. Um, and uh, so that, that was really the first kind of wave of disease that just destroyed millions and millions of people. And the smallpox epidemic just kept coming back. It came back again in the 19th century and destroyed a lot of the Plains people. And that, actually that was a really critical time for the Plains people because the, the bison were uh, disappearing. And a lot of my work is really examining the um, interactions of that colonial period in, in, in the 19th century when um, the, the indigenous uh, populations were being forced to sign treaties. So, um, and that, that is also kind of that period of art history that I, I look at quite closely. So, um, but I guess H1N1 swine flu is about 20, no, 2013 possibly, uh, no, 2000 and, I want to say 2010, maybe 10 years ago, and I had H1N1, <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't much fun. Um, but uh, you know, at the time, the government um, was expecting a lot of fatalities, and instead of sending medical supplies, they sent body bags to uh, some of the reserves in, in in Canada, and so that was sort of you know that really spoke to you know how the colonial government sort of. Uh, you know, treat indigenous people instead of sending, you know, medical supplies, they send body bags. And so I made this image of mischief on this uh, bison hide and, and kind of, you know, call it the queen size body bag. So there's two more images. 
um, that go with that. Uh, there's a zipper, uh, and inside that that bag, there's a quote from from uh, a chief, uh, you know, uh, of one of the communities. Uh, so there there was a, a way to speak about the the history of disease and pandemics, but also bring it up to the present. Uh, with those two quotes that run in, kind of in the, in the back of that bag. And then um, going up to uh, Shame and Prejudice um, and the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission report. Um, in 2015, I was approached to uh, create an exhibition um, to respond to Canada's 150th birthday, which was in 2017 at, at the University of Toronto Art Museum. And with that project, I wanted to create a, a, a large uh, sort of overarching uh, exhibition that could speak to some of the chapters of this colonial history of this country and, you know, take us from that time of plenty, you know, with the fur trade where Indigenous people were kind of partners in the economy, all the way up to the, uh, the deprivation, the starvation, and up into the present where these colonial policies have just, you know, through the residential schools really uh, had such a, a devastating impact on our communities. So um, one of the, one of the, I think one of the most striking images in that exhibition, or at least I thought it was maybe the most important image is the scream. And do you guys have an image of that? Yeah, so uh, go back one, yeah. That's it. So this is not necessarily technically my best painting, but this certainly became the most important painting of that exhibition because uh, in the Truth and Reconciliation uh, report, um, there were thousands and thousands of testimonies of Indigenous people who um, spoke about their experiences in residential schools. And this scene was what came up over and over again. And it was a description, a very visceral, violent description of indigenous children being ripped from their parents' arms and taken off on a truck or in a boat or a plane to residential school. And I realized that, you know, in the history, the art history of this continent, there are no paintings that really speak to indigenous experience uh, that authorizes so many of our experiences into art history. Most of the art history that, that exists in our museums is told from the settler perspective you know, they romanticize indigenous people, whether they're George Catlin or Paul Kane or, you know, Albert Bierstadt, but there's very few images other than those made by indigenous people that really challenge this, uh, the authority of this canon of our history. And so, you know, over the past few years prior to this, I've been really kind of moving away from landscape painting, wanting to really make those history paintings that could authorize our experience into the canon of our history, because I really believe that Painting has this power to um, not just tell stories, but convey emotion and, and, and explore many themes. Um, it's a very sophisticated language of painting, and uh, it's a very, uh, sorry, it's a very sophisticated vocabulary of visual expression. Um, there are things you can do in painting that you can't do with photography. And so this was really like a kind of a, an interesting sort of turning point in, in my own studio practice because I was, um, you know, starting to work with uh, more painting assistants and um, we were kind of finding our way through the process, you know, shooting models and trying to find a way to uh, create these large uh, history paintings that could really get, get into and, and, and communicate these uh, very important um, experiences of, of Indigenous people across, across the country. So this, this painting really, for me was a kind of a turning point. Um, it was a turning point too in, 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 in terms of audience because uh, as the exhibition developed, you know, I had nine chapters that kind of went from the period of New France all the way up to the urban res, essentially where indigenous people live uh, like second class citizens in our urban centers. And um, this painting, uh, we posted it on Facebook about a week before the exhibition opened and I just watched that image go viral. We had about 300,000 views within a few days. And I knew that I had sort of hit a nerve with this painting because um, again, it really spoke to so many thousands and thousands of experiences. Like so many indigenous families have been impacted 
um, through this multi-generational uh, violence of this of the residential schools. My own grandmother was a residential school survivor, and um, you know that really impacted our own family. And so here finally was this authoritative image, this history painting that could you know um, go into museums across the country and and um, ask people to really think about about the version of history that they learned in high school that they learned in school and, 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 and most people were never taught about uh, real, uh, the real history, uh, the, the, what happened um, to indigenous people. So you, know, you have people graduating from universities who never knew about residential schools. Uh, it's a, it's a, a gut-wrenching read for, for having um, gone through it and, um, and the authors are, are very measured in their words uh, but they have gone so far as to say that it was basically a cultural genocide, uh, pure and simple. The, all these children were basically ripped from their, their school and were, were meant to be transformed into white people uh, and they were made to think and speak white. As, well, as you know, the United Nations, one of, one of their definitions of geno genocide is the forcible transfer, transfer of children from one cultural group to another. And that's what's happening on the southern U.S. border now. It's another genocide down there where they're taking children and they're, they're removing them from their parents. And so that, that is a form of genocide when you remove children from their parents because you interrupt the flow of culture. So yeah. what happened in those residential schools is children were, were, lost their languages. They lost their connection to their cultural... Uh, worldviews and it decimated families and it decimated uh, the, the the passing down of cultural traditions so you know our communities are still uh, you know reeling from from the impact of residential schools right and it was systematic it was not um, anecdotal it was not um, here and there it was all over the, the place um, I saw this exhibition at the McCord Museum in Montreal, which is a history and ethnography museum. And um, the way you embedded your work within, you know, the, uh, uh, the flow and, and the presentation of historical documents, archival documents, you know, the, the Confederation Fathers photography, the, the, the letters, it was just, just a, a, not, not just a, um, a demonstration of your art, but of, um, of a true engagement, almost that of a historian, an archivist, an archeologist, um, and, and you subverted every single piece of that, that narrative from, from the very start, New France, New England, um, all the way up. Um, it was a very complex undertaking. Uh, you so, wanna, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's been part of my, my work too, is working with museums. And um, you know, those paintings from the 19th century, those images of Edward Curtis, uh, those images of uh, George Catlin, all of those myths and romantic views and, and uh, you know, subjective points of view have all been perpetuated through the colonial museums. And, and so you can't change how the audience interprets those works until you help them reinterpret and see those things from a different perspective. And that's why I love working with museum collections because there's this wealth of uh, all kinds of material, whether it's indigenous material or it's you know, uh, European or what have you, and you can bring these things together to reframe uh, the conversation. And, and then I, I curate those things together with my own work and then you end up with a, a very powerful way of you know, um, challenging and understanding uh, this history, which is a shared history from a very different point of view. All right. Um, before we go to the paintings at the Met, which are really the ultimate monumental embodiment of, of uh, this way of working, curator was actually the, the word I was looking for, archivist. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, before we go to, uh, to the Met, I'd, uh, I'd love us to see uh, Mary. I haven't seen it in years. It's a two minute, two minute and a half video. And uh, it's mischief uh, again. Um, and it's all about the breaking of treatises um, um, in the, you know, of, of, it's an endless, endless uh, uh, se series of, of, of breaking of treatises.
great piece. I like how it's, um, you know, it starts off on a very camp note and then suddenly it, it uh, the emotion, you know, sort of comes through and packs quite a punch. And uh, I remember through, from one of our discussions, how you had said that, um, you know, from the very start uh, within the indigenous people, there were a number who had embraced uh, with some sort of fascination, you know, European uh, ways of dressing and had gone into mixing them. And uh, I think that video brings, brings forth the, the sense of uh, openness um, that a lot of indigenous people showed. You know, the narrative is that they were always attacking, uh, you know, uh, uh, wagons and, and, and settlers. Um, the reality is that they, you know, they showed a lot of curiosity, openness, and it showed also in that dandy figure uh, that some representations of the 19th century have shown and that you have, you know, built part of your work on. Yeah, well, you know, it's a very complex history, and uh, that's those are the those are the conversations I'm interested in, and the nuanced ones that um, are are unpacking a very long and complicated relationship where we've been in in contact with with each other for a very long time. We've intermarried, we we've we've taken influence uh, back and forth, but uh, when you have a dominant culture uh, and um, you know uh, a culture that is being um, suppressed. Uh, you, you know, the balance of power shifts and, you know, that, that piece was, uh, in, in context of that piece, that, that was, uh, again, exploring uh, two museum collections, the McCord Museum and uh, the Montreal Museum. And that was very much about, um, you know, again, looking for uh, a different way of looking at these colonial relationships. And so one of the themes that came out of that uh, exhibition were, 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 was hair and how, you know, hair, when we, we grow, you know, indigenous people grow our hair long and then it's cut, it was cut for children when they went to residential school. So um, it, was a, it was also a way of, uh, you know, using hair as a way to understand, uh, as a metaphor for these relationships uh, and understanding um, interpretations of the treaties. Like indigenous people interpreted the treaties very differently. Like, you know, Cree people, when they signed the treaties, they, they we basically went into kinship with, with European settlers. So uh, set, all of you settlers are now our, our, our kin. And that's a very different way of understanding the treaties uh, than the European settler cultures do. They just think, oh, that's a piece of land that you sold off, you signed this agreement and therefore it's ours. And you know that, that, that way of thinking was a particularly uh, brutal um, in, in, in the, the area where I'm from, because my, my family was dispossessed uh, uh, of our land. Uh, my great grandmother was born on a community there where um, the government came in and, and, and pushed everybody out. And that's, I think one of the largest land thefts in North America is about 50,000 acres of an established Victorian community uh, where it, people had, had lived for, for a very, very, very long time. So, you know, my work is really, um, always looking for those nuanced ways of talking about a very complicated relationship and finding ways to, um, to do it with, with, with humor and sexiness, you know, that, so I wanted that, that video to feel like a shampoo commercial essentially because it was about hair. Um, do you want to bring us to the uh, paintings that are currently uh, up at the Met? Sure. The wooden boat people, which is how the indigenous would call the Europeans. Right. So, yeah. yeah. The, the title of the exhibition is Mistagosawak. It's a Cree. It's a Cree word, and it it, it literally uh, means the, the wooden boat people. But it was used uh, kind of you know originally for the French, but then kind of loosely to talk about you know just European settlers in in, in the eastern part of of Canada. Um, so I was approached uh, almost two years ago now by um, by the Met um, to they were just launching this new uh, series of commissions and I was gonna be the second or third. And um, they were familiar with some of my museum based projects and they wanted to welcome that kind of project into their museum, which I thought was revolutionary for a major US museum to want to have me go into their collection and unpack uh, their collection and look for ways to, again, bridge uh, some of these gaps and open new conversations and 
and you know um, challenge some of these uh, um, very outdated ideas of indigenous people that are still being perpetuated in museums. So, you know, I made a beeline to certain sculptures in, in their collection in, in, um, in the, the courtyard. Um, and, you know, I looked at uh, paintings and I found lots of inspiration for these two pieces, which um, were also inspired by the Great Hall itself being this place of arrivals and departures. And, you know, I was thinking about New York itself being this portal for immigration where so many millions of settlers came from Europe and poured into North America, displacing indigenous people. So on the left side, you have a uh, painting, it's called Welcoming the Newcomers and Miss Chief is kind of bending over and she's helping these people uh, who are essentially um, like refugees, shipwrecked and they're climbing out of the ocean and uh, you know, behind her are these other indigenous characters. Most of them are based on works in, in, in the Met uh, collection. And on the right side is uh, this kind of dystopian image of the indigenous people being displaced in this migrant vessel where now the sea itself has kind of um, dispossessed them of that little piece of land that's left that is um, uh, being defended now by these white nationalists with with uh, with rifles. So um, the piece was really to design for that space where they could you know they could be in conversation with each other uh, left and right, and to really speak to these uh, this variety of themes. Can we um, can we have um, uh, close-ups of of one and the other for yeah for the the audience. So, you know, um, I, I love great painting. And so I, uh, I wanted to kind of riff on, on these images of Venus and Adonis that, that are in the Met collection. And, uh, you know, Rubens riffed on Titian's Venus and Adonis. So I thought I'd sort of include both of their versions, you know, as a quote, quotes in, in, in this painting. And, you know, what, what I loved about those paintings were, is that they were about this kind of tension and struggle between these um, this male and female. And um, so, uh, you know, it was about the hunt, you know. Uh, Venus was trying to restrain Adonis from going out into the boar hunt where he was subsequently killed. And um, so I made it about the, tr the, the fur trade, you know, about a, an indigenous woman and a trapper. And so I've got a little beaver uh, sort of substituted that, that little uh, putti or baby that's in that painting for a beaver. And um, so this is the kind of thing that I like to, to do when I, when I create my works. I like to really um, not limit myself to, to, to one area of the museum. I like to kind of explore, uh, you know, a variety of the, uh, of the different collections. And I loved that in, in, in the Great Hall, you know, Miss Chief is standing there and the sculpture in front of her, that huge sculpture in front of her is Athena, you know? I don't know if you can see it in that image, but um, it's the goddess of war and Miss Chief, yeah, there's Athena there. And so Miss Chief is this goddess of love, you know? She's really imparting values, Cree values that are, um, you know, important to me that really speak to um, kinship and um, uh, kindness and love. And um, I've really modeled and really built her character about uh, on those values because those are the values that you can transcend, uh, that you can transcend all of this darkness and all of this colonial um, trauma um, and to, to kind of, you know, inform people that, you know, these are the values that shape uh, us as, as Cree people and uh, these are the things that give us our resilience. And so that painting is very much about the spirit of resilience of indigenous people who are in that boat. So maybe we could look at that image of the boat and you'll see, uh, you know, I, I, cast, I cast indigenous uh, people from, from my community and I invite people to come in. And, and, uh, and so uh, it's very much a celebration of, of the, the resilience in our community that transcends um, you know, the dispossession of our land and the residential schools and all these different colonial policies that are still, that still, that still affect us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wary of time. I, I would have liked us to, uh, like you to, to talk about how, um, um, 
how your process has evolved. You, you know, uh, I still see that same beautiful quality of light in those paintings, as someone else uh, uh, said, uh, as in Trappers of Men, they're shining. They have like this, this, this sheen that's absolutely uh, um, magnetic. Uh, um, and, uh, and your process has evolved significantly, but I'm wary of time. Maybe you can uh, touch briefly on that before we go to questions. Uh, we, we're getting a lot of, uh, of questions. Yeah, so I think over the years, um, as I started to work with more assistants, I realized that, uh, you know, I was really limited, uh, my own output, my own ability to make the kind of work I wanted to make was really limited by these two hands. And uh, so I started to, to work with assistants in, in, in a range of different capacities, you know, whether there was administrative and now I have a team of 16 and, you know, I have people helping with social media and I have people that, with administration and I have managers and a creative director and painters and and so really the vision became about how can we you know um take this vision for you know these great make very large paintings and um do it in, in a way that you know um it, it makes it it uh, makes it a practical thing to you know because this met met project i think we ended up with about eight months to make those two huge paintings so we work with models and we, we, we devise uh, techniques in the studio to photograph them a certain way to get the kind of light that I need. You know, I do sketches, very small sketches first, and then, and then we go, we cast everybody and we costume everybody. And there's, there's a long process of getting to a point where before we're even painting. And uh, my team helps me execute uh, this, this project all the way through. And then, you know, many, many months of us working on these paintings together and, um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of hours spent there um, on them myself, but also, you know, I'm I'm working with the painters constantly too, directing them and and guiding my team through this. And the great thing about that process too is that it is collaborative, and I have the benefit of you know 16 other minds and hands and eyes and hearts all uh, basically uh, invested in this project and. That's what makes these um, these projects really come to life. Is that they're 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 uh, there's a, there's so much energy um, from my team that goes into them. Um, a few questions, uh, Kent. Um, I see one um, uh, from Clinton Carlson. Uh, uh, how has resilience played out through your artwork? Uh, was resilience important to the messages you express? It's absolutely crucial because, you know, I think the, the, the colonial project, which is still ongoing, is a devastating project. You know, it, it's about dispossession and the removal of language, the destruction of cultures. And I have to, the only way I can really transcend the, 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 those, those things is to actually um, think about uh, the positive aspects and to think about um, turning those things, looking at very dark and difficult things and turning them into things of beauty and things of transcendence. And that's what resilience is about. And I think um, I am, I'm so inspired by uh, so many people in, in my own community that have, that are knowledge keepers, that have kept the, the cultural knowledge alive, that keep the languages alive, that, uh, that, 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 just pour pour that kind of energy into our young people um and so you know resilience is like really central to my work and i i wouldn't i wouldn't be an artist i don't think if i if i didn't believe in in, in that in that resilience yeah um another question from uh, alex mann uh, your work and and it really goes to the also to the heart of it your work exposes and critiques connections between sex and violence sometimes with scenes that may be engaging to viewers through their eroticism. How do you personally manage that uh, tension? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, those first, uh, first few images that I made were, were uh, exploring power, power dynamics through sexuality, you know, with these very kind of humorous uh, pairings of cowboys and Indians. And that was a way to, um, you know, uh, basically refute colonized sexuality. You know, we have so much shame as indigenous people about our bodies and about our sexuality, and that all came from the settler cultures, you know. We had a place in our own communities for 
two-spirited people. We had a place for people who wanted to live in the other gender. We had all these plural ways of understanding sexuality and gender, and then it got smaller and smaller and smaller the more the church and the government got involved in our community. So, you know, um, having a very empowered understanding of sexuality and, 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 and having no shame about it, you know, Miss Chief is, has no shame about her sexuality. And uh, to me, that was really important because that sends a very powerful message about indigenous sexuality. And that's one of the things that I'm very proud of is that um, we had a place for uh, the LGTB, LG btq people <laughs> of north america we, we had that already and you know the settler cultures are just getting there now and um so yeah i'm i'm very proud of of the fact that indigenous people ha have a place for 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 two-spirited people yeah um that, that's a good one from beth robinson what do you do for your self-care I um, drink lots of water. <laughs> uh, you know, I think my art in many ways is my self-care. I think I said that in the Hirshhorn video, like my art, my painting is actually, especially in these times, it's such a, it's the thing that I go to, uh, I've always gone to in, in um, difficult times and in good times, but it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful form of meditation, I think. And um, so I spent a lot of hours painting. Uh, I spent a lot of hours painting the last, you know, two and a half months. And um, it really helps uh, keep me uh, focused and grounded. And then, and then the beauty of that is that you see results from those hours, you know. <clears throat> uh, I try not to read too much bad news. Um, try and get um, some regular exercise. But, you know, I also live in the country here so I get I get fresh air and I'm fortunate that I'm able to work out here right now. Yeah, have you gone back to drawing if you've never actually stopped? To drawing? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm drawing. Usually the drawing the drawings um, are the conceptual uh, part of my project. So I'm I'm drawing whenever I'm developing new ideas. So there's always a, there's always drawing going on when I'm working on new projects. Mhm. Mm um a more pointed question as to the, um, from uh, Cher Anderson Petty, uh, might you ever create any paintings that address the intersections between indigenous people and involuntary immigrants and their descendants? And I think that's something that also re refers to your paintings at the Met. Yeah, there, there was an opportunity in, in, that, uh, in that project to speak about the involuntary immigrants, um, the people that were brought as slaves, uh, the people who were escaping, you know, um, uh, maybe as migrants uh, from other um, troubled areas. And, you know, that, that really, is, uh, you know, Indigenous, you know, when I think about how Cree worldview, it, it's, it's, um, it's about creating um, space for, for, for others. And um, that's what I wanted. I wanted those paintings to, to really um, feel like Indigenous people um, you know, uh, our leaders in terms of, you know, how we um, think about other cultures and how we make, create a place within the circle for, for other cultures. Kent, um, I mean, there are other questions. You have a lot of fans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you want to look at the Q&A and, and uh, or else we, we, you know, call it a day. You've been super generous with your, your your time and your thoughts and your and and your explanations uh, it's been a great pleasure to see you um thank you for this first uh, ever zoom public conversation uh, my first two my first two everyone's first <laughs> and thank you to the audience for having been so present it's great to have so many people um and it's really great to come together for the first time around your art really uh, true privilege and an honor to remember. Well, thank you, Stefan. It's always great having these conversations with you. You know my work so well because you've known it for a very long time. So it yeah, was yeah. a real pleasure. And yeah. thank you to everyone else at the Hirshhorn. Really appreciate your interest in my work and for supporting my work. Of course. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.